Anu, can we start or should we wait for some more? Hello. Yeah, Anu, can uh, you we, hear me? Yeah, we can start. Okay. So, do you want to give a brief uh, intro or should I take over? This is a second class, uh, uh, Araipu, so you can start off. Okay. Okay, so I'm putting uh, everybody on mute, uh, you know, uh, for the interest of, uh, you know, some of the hygiene stuff like there is no sound uh, or noise pollution or cracking of the voice, etc. Okay, so you guys can, you know, message me as and when, uh, you know, there is some clarification that you need. And we can, uh, you know, uh, I can, you know, unmute you and then we can speak about it. All right. So good morning, everybody. Uh, though we are 10 minutes late in the class, but uh, let me quickly introduce myself and where I come from, what I do and, uh, you know, uh, what brings me here, etc. Uh, so I'm, my name is Raipu Boyapati. I work for IBM and uh, as general manager HR, I head the Hyderabad location for IBM uh, from HR standpoint. And um, so I come up with about uh, 18, 18 and a half years of experience. I mean, worked in different industries like uh, IT, telecom, pharma, uh, etc. So I've been with IBM for the last six years. Um, so I played multiple roles within IBM as client HR partner, location HR leader, uh, moved around different business units, supporting the executive leaders and some of them being global leaders, etc. So I come with multi uh, functions, uh, experience within HR, you know, having handled recruitment portfolio, talent management portfolio, uh, the HR journalist portfolio and the learning and development and uh, as the uh, head of the function in, you know, one or two places, including the current one. Uh, so that, so that's the uh, varied experience that I bring within the HR function. And, um, what brings me here is uh, purely out of my passion uh, for uh, teaching and uh, this is how I express myself, um, you know, uh, giving back to the students or the enthusiasts uh, who want to know a little bit about the jar and, you know, uh, participating in management uh, education. So that's a brief uh, introduction about uh, myself and uh, so I think uh, this is the third batch that uh, I'm going to interact uh, from uh, Black Works and Geetam's, um, you know, collaboration. Uh, there are second batch, which is currently running. First batch we completed, I guess, from an HR module standpoint. So I look forward to meet you face to face uh, in a while. Um, so, but before that, I thought, um, you know, when we were discussing with Anun, the way we should take it this forward, that we will first connect on, you know, uh, just to get to know what HR is all about and what do we do within HR function? There are a lot of things that many employees do not get to understand what it is all about. Uh, many a times what happens is uh, HR for folks is, um, is like, a, uh, what do you call, uh, you know, it's like a payroll or some amount of learning and development, or, you know, if there are any employee grievances or any questions, etc. But I want to change your perception you know, after the uh, entire module that we're going to cover, I think we're going to have 24 odd hours uh, besides this three hour session today. Uh, I would want to change your perception by the end of the uh, 24 hours or eight modules that we will have that HR is beyond all of this, okay? Not that, uh, you know, it is something in the air and we don't see what it is, right? It's all about something that is real. It's all about uh, management systems and practices and it's all about how you perceive some of these things as management graduates. I would want certain things to be very clear that, you know, HR function, you know, HR uh, uh, human resources as a function is all about people. The way you deal with people, the way you interact with your people, what you do with them and, you know, how you build their careers, how you enable careers working with business leaders and, you know, business executives and making things happen from a people 
you know, standpoint. You all know that within the organizations there are multiple functions, right? There are sales function, marketing, there is finance, there is legal, there is HR, um, and project management, and a whole lot of things, right? Each function has its own role to play, right? And I'm sure your intent to get into this management education is an example of trying to understand what management is all about. You guys are all experts. You guys are all really good at in your current skill, whatever, be it IT, pharma, whichever industry you come from. But you are good at what you currently do. What I understand is that your intent of getting into management education is to become, you know, or aspire to become future leaders or future managers and aspire to become, make it big in terms of your career. This particular, you know, module uh, uh, in the name, in the form of uh, uh, management uh, education, in the form of MBA education, uh, you know, you don't want to become future leaders and make it really big strides forward in terms of management education. I think that's the context of where we are and and I would want to bring constantly this element of people. You, know? you all deal with machines, you all deal with systems, procedures, policies, uh, you know, clients and various other stakeholders. We go to focus um, uh, in this class to try and give you an overview of what HR is all about. What do we do within the HR function? And we will build on the overview that I'm going to give, give today in the next, uh, you know, eight modules that we will have when, whenever it happens in a month or so from now. Okay, so that's the context, right? So you can always uh, chat with me or message me if you have any, you, know, you want to have clarifications or any doubts, etc. Just chat with me and I will respond to you. Uh, but don't become silent spectators, right? Uh, like the way it happens on a lighter side, right? Whenever some of these calls happen on a virtual calls, right? You put yourself on mute and do whatever you want to do. Sometimes even watching movies, right? So people do that, I've noticed that. So I don't want you to get into that mode of um, education, which is a waste of time for you and me as well. And I don't want to be unproductive that way, right? So try and make sure you are utilizing your next couple of hours very productively, be active participant, try and understand what we are trying to learn, sometimes unlearn, and most importantly, try and get the view of what we are, you know, uh, trying to cover. Like, like I said, I'm going to give you an overview of um, entire human resource management, right? So, so that's, that's the context. So any questions, I'll just unmute you guys, uh, you know, just for a minute to see if you have any questions. Uncle, morning. Uncle, you need to uncle. Sorry, sir, I need to make a lot of Two o'clock Hello. Okay. So So let me get to this subject uh, without any further delay. Uh, so human resources uh, uh, management, human resources like we all know is about people, right? It's about how we manage our people, how we deal with our people and how we engage our people. First and foremost, this function is all about management, systems, practices, concepts, and the techniques that we, you know, deploy and execute for making sure there is transparency within the system, there is uh, a method to madness that what we want to do, and let it be a seamless affair when it comes to people, okay? 
the first and foremost i want all of us to be very very clear that you know human resources or hr is all about uh, management systems practices or techniques let me give you a few examples what are these management uh, systems or practices or techniques that we are talking about what really happens with, with when it comes to people in the organizations it's it's when when you come into the organizations it's all about uh, you know hiring people you know making sure their journey throughout from hiring to you know retiring or in in most cases or attracting or in some cases retiring from the organization like you know your onboarding process your engagement process your performance management process your payroll process your learning and development process your uh, benefits uh, you know uh, indirect compensation like insurance uh, etc etc and then your uh, talent management how do you retain your people you know when there is attrition happening you know we will talk a little bit about uh, how important it is to retain critical skills important skills because the cost of the hiring is exponentially high and uh, you would not believe some of the numbers that i would quote as in when it comes to uh, it's going to be pretty pretty costly affair if you don't retain critical people and uh, uh, hot skills or the growth skills that we see in the organizations versus when you start hiring them from the external market so all of these different touch points for employees you know the recruitment or the talent acquisition to onboarding to uh you know uh, the learning and development the constant uh, feedback mechanism through performance management system through you know employee engagement to various interventions we are uh, celebrating various milestones to talent management in terms of uh, making sure you retain your top talent making sure you kind of weed out the bottom performing the low performing to make sure you are constantly engaging your high potential uh, uh you know uh, people to make a, make a floor or make an organization of a performance uh, driven culture organization right and to make sure your employees are learning your employees are skilling constantly right all of these are part of human resources as a function okay so that's the overview that i would want to begin with okay now if you have to do like in any of the engagement right uh, somebody is trying to pin you uh and then say you unable to hear can you reconnect okay okay somebody is pinging uh okay so thank you okay great yeah so all of this is part of uh, human resource function now like you know in any of the uh, uh, successful you know what do you call uh, organizations and most uh, successful organizations believe in process driven organization than a person driven organization let me give an example of uh, both what is a person driven organization person driven organization is something like you know where you know if there is a team of 25 30 people right and these 25 30 people you know uh, uh go with whatever that particular manager says or an organization which will which will run based on the instructions of the ceo or a managing director rather than practically believing in the systems and practices that are enabled in the system you are pretty much within the system than outside the system when you try to uh, you know run the organization right so so that's more of a person driven organization you know you have your typical some of the crude examples if i were to give you say for example uh, uh, an organization which is uh, how would i say what would i quote for example few years back uh, i remember reliance used to be called a very very person with an what sort of um, you know you know people like uh, bunnies of the world the way they want to drive the organization uh, not really believing in the system and process and what's most important is only profits and nothing more beyond that right 
versus the same another Indian company like Tata, right? We are very, very process driven organization, a very, very ethical organization, system driven, principles driven. So therefore there is transparency in the system. They walk the talk across the line of chain in all the 9200 odd products that they have across the world, right? So what happens, what really happens in a person driven organization versus a process driven organization? It really means that you are sending a, when you are working in a process driven organization, system driven organization, is that you are sending a message of transparency, you are sending a message of being ethical, you are consistent with your message, you don't mix your words when you, when you talk and when you lead the practices. Versus a person driven organization where people are madly running after profits and whatever that particular leader or a CEO or a managing director says is the mantra of the, or Veda to run the organization. Sometimes compromising the ethics, sometimes uh, compromising on people and not really being consistent with your message. So there's a huge difference between uh, when an organization is revolving around uh, systems, practices, strong policies, strong ethics and strong techniques, right? Uh, you would have heard uh, hundreds of examples and read, read in the newspapers, including the recent one uh, with, where uh, the Nissan CEO is being sacked, is being put behind the bus, right? So he tried to manipulate the policy, he tried to manipulate the system, trying to own curves of rupees in, in the form of uh, you know, uh, misusing the authority, right? That's a clear example of trying to be the boss of your place rather than being within the system, you know, respecting the authority that is given to you, right? So we'll talk more about, uh, you know, when it comes to managing people uh, in the process of hiring to the entire different facets of employee life cycle, you know, like the examples that we quote have, like hiring, performance management, training and development, reskilling and upskilling in the skills area. Then you retain your top talent, high potential employees, and then you engage your people, etc., etc. If you have to do all of these different facets of human resource function, like the examples or the areas that I quoted, you've got to be very, very strong in your strategy, right? If you really get into or you had the opportunity of talking to or being part of some of the boardroom discussions, what really happens is there is always a uh, uh, a struggle between a CFO and a CHRO, right? You know who is a CFO, right? The chief financial officer. So he, he he looks after the cost part of it, whereas the CHRO, who is the chief human resource officer, looks after people and people agenda, right? So uh, the discussion, at least some discussion that I get, to, I'm just quoting this example for you to understand what really happens in the back door, is that a CFO would look at, you know, things like engagement or a training or a skill aspect or a increments or promotion as a cost. Whereas a CHR or a HR leader would look at all of this as an investment. If you don't invest in your top talent, imagine if they re resign and go, your cost of hiring is exponentially high. The example that I said at the beginning of the context setting is, is an on an average, it takes to six to nine months time. Because your three months of uh, lead time that you give to recruiters, another three months for you to onboard the person, and another three months for you to onboard the person, getting to know the account or the project, know the people, know the stakeholders, know the clients, and for you to actually to become productive, right? The learning curve is almost starting from hiring to the, your learning curve is almost nine months. Imagine the cost that you would have. In, uh, 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 incurred in this in the form of uh, training cost in the form of recruitment cost in the form of onboarding cost right the 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 exponential increment that you would have given to onboard that person versus all of these costs would have been a saving if you have invested even if 20 to 30 percent of this nine months cost in an existing employee imagine the kind of savings that you go through Normally, in an IT industry, which is where I come from, and roughly around um, most of the industries are anywhere between 15 to 20 percent of average attrition that you have. Imagine on a scale of 100 people, you are losing 
15 to 20 people into the market. And if imagine an organization like IBM in India, we have about one lakh people. And if my average acquisition is about 20%, in a year, I lose 20,000 people to the market. Look at this 20,000 people into nine months of uh, unproductive time. Look at the kind of loss that organization will have gone through. So, so the battle that all the time the HR leaders or people leaders or people managers, we call them here, the battle that they make it is, you invest in my people in terms of skill, in terms of promotion, in terms of salary hikes, in terms of training and development, in terms of uh, uh, you know talent retention for high potential, etc. Even if you invest one third of what you go through these uh, nine months of time, is significantly giving you revenue benefit or a cost benefit rather than a, uh, you know you hire them from external market right so that's the kind of you know people engagement that i would want you to believe that i would want you to try and understand right you are by the end of the you know today's session and the face-to-face uh, -face sessions that we will have shortly uh, one would need to understand would need to believe that people is the most precious important aspect of uh, any organization right now today everybody is talking about ai machine learning you know your uh, uh, what do you call automation your robotics and your uh, newer technologies like blockchain etc etc they're all coming up uh, and you know trying to create that sometimes a fear in the people mindset oh my job is at stake or i'm not relevant let me tell you the good news is we do have as much of a job actually more than what the fear that is being projected in the market the problem today the world is going through is lack of skills the skill deficiency including the developed markets like us or europe is exponentially high people or leaders do not have skilled resources that are available in the market. If you have to build this skilled resources, skilled workforce into the uh, system, into the organization, trying to be relevant to the organization, strategy plays a very, very important role. That's where I'm going to spend a little bit of a time. What is a strategy? A strategy is nothing but you kind of visualize in a holistic picture. Where do I start? What do I want to achieve? And how would I see my organization from time to time becoming profitable than maintain organization? No organization in the world, no leader in the world would want to run an organization for charity. Okay? We're all here for a clear purpose, clear mindset that we will become profitable. Right? No, I'm, I'm sure none of us or any uh, industrialist or any entrepreneur would want to start a business trying to become or uh, trying to run for charity or, a, uh, or trying to, you know, wanting to run into losses. Everybody wants to be successful, profitable and cost efficient. Now, if you have to do that, it doesn't happen overnight dreaming about becoming profitable. It has to have a clear blueprint in terms of what are my sales goals? What are my marketing strategy? What is my people strategy? What is my finance strategy? How do I optimize my cost? How do I reduce my fixed costs in terms of missionary people, etc.? You would have read all of this in your uh, other classes into marketing and finance, right? How do I all the time optimize my fixed cost and try and become market relevant and try and become uh, profitable? And the same thing happens in, when it comes to human resources function, which is your, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, you know, people strategy. Okay, so when it comes to people strategy, the the strategy that we would want to all the time, uh, or HR leaders all the time work with business leaders and partnering with them, trying to make a blueprint or a uh, you know yearly plan in terms of fall plan or a spring plan, try and make a plan which is relevant to the people strategy of that particular year. Normally most established organizations most reputed organizations or mncs or whatever you call them as uh, have a very clear strategy in both in terms of planning and executing so the planning in terms of when it comes to people 
people do plan for example i am an it industry and i am into infra services for example right now let's take an example of ibm where i come from just for the example sake right so ibm as an infra organization ibm is uh, into end it provider is one of the only company in the world which which does the end to end it products we are into application we are into product we are into research we are into uh, software labs we are into infra and customer delivery project management whatever you it domains that you talk about ibm is the one and only company in the world which has the end to end space okay but let me restrict myself to an example of an infra space okay so the hr leader for infra okay which manages about roughly around 50000 people worldwide would want to discuss with the uh, infra leader worldwide what is going to be my people strategy for the year right what's going to be my recruitment strategy do i am i going to hire millennials or graduate hires try and optimize the cost and invest in them in terms of skills and reduce my cost as fixed cost from an experienced resources or skills which are declining or uh, skills or, or 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 the competencies which i don't need any more what do i mean by that for example you have a skill of a mainframe which typically manages the uh, uh, servers and storage etc okay back about till uh, 2012 or 13 storage which runs into huge your uh, physical servers uh, used to be the you know most hot skill that that was relevant to the market come up with come with a skill called as a cloud some of you are aware of this example which completely changed the game from a, for a storage space and in prime industry cloud came we said if you are incurring a cost of 100 rupees on a mainframe server i am going to give you a public domain or a private domain say for 25 30 rupees look at the cost benefit that this particular skill is going to give which is almost 70% of your saving right so no no company like i said would want to run into losses when they say cost benefit so the game changed very significantly the example of a mainframe server which used to be 100 rupees cost to a cloud server cloud space um, skill which comes to you for 30 rupees right so every leader between the hr leader and the business leader would frame that yearly strategy hr planning people planning or human resource planning in terms of where do i hire what do i hire where do i invest on my skills what sort of performance management will i do when i say performance management let me give you another example and i'm trying to link all of these to strategy right say if i'm having a skill of uh, say 60% which is a maintain skill in the market today versus i have a vision that 75% of my skill need to be in the growth skill or the hot skills that are needed in the market whereas i am today living with 60% of uh, just maintain skill on some of them or even decline skill or absolute skills it's a big problem statement for an hr leader and a business leader back in the board group right so how so i set a target for the year this year i must reduce at least a 25% Uh, of the maintain skill or a decline skill to a growth skill so what's going to be my skill strategy how do I, how do i upskill or a reskill my resources okay so there is a training budget that let get allocated let me give an, another example of uh, performance management where you know uh, i have skills that are available in the market whereas the the, the industry is moving from x y z skills to the other set of skills so how do i performance manage some of the bottom performers normally 5 to 10% is what they set a target you must have a minimum of 5 to 10% of your overall population who are to be either skilled up or uh, it's like what they call it in a cool way shape in or shape out if you don't shape out you're out of the system right there are stringent hr practices to put you in tips and then you know actions are taken for you to you know check out of the organization right so and when i do the performance management i must clearly differentiate to uh, with the uh, high potential employees or the high contributing employees or the high pots uh, that we call them 
you must recognize them with significant increments and where eligible promote them now whenever you invest on increment or promotion it's a cost that you're going to incur from x to y because you're going to give hikes you're going to you know move them to the next floor you got to incur that cost so what sort of budgets will i have for my uh, people who are high pots people who are consistently delivering beyond my expectations so what sort of increment budget or a budget for promotion that i will have so i can give you a number of examples of different facets of hr where you know um, you know hr leaders with the business leaders formulate the hr strategy to call it as simple the people strategy people strategy which will include hiring people strategy which will include training skilling performance management employee engagement employee retention uh, talent management in overall bucket that you call it as all of them will be forming part of the your overall people strategy and how you execute your people strategy in various markets and various geographies and various units okay and in net what it actually does is to to formulate policies and practices to produce uh, right behaviors and right competencies right that's what the bottom line when you draw up a blueprint in the boardroom to execution that happens over the year and when you assess at the end of the year that do you really have the right set of employees who have right competencies and right behaviors right so that's the strategy that you build in and once you build in the strategy you will try and evolve your systems your practices your um, you know your policies within the organization now the the starting point to all of this strategy to you know execution now one step back a strategy sitting in a board room has no value unless until you execute them to in the right spirit right so you must make sure all the time your strategy is in sync with the execution most organizations today are struggling because their ability to deal with people at times becomes a real real challenge you as a leader as a business leader are under the impression i gave my target and the team will deliver no it will not happen overnight or thinking or visualizing it will happen this must have clear examples of clear goals for performance assessment when i do my performance assessment i must be assessed on goals that are clearly laid out for me and that's where another important phase of human resources or people management is i'm going to introduce to you is the person called manager who is a manager a manager is somebody who manages people end to end right uh, a ceo or a managing director or a or a chairman of the company cannot be present all over say 1 lakh employees that are available in a particular office. even if there are 10000 people even if there are 1000 people th- this person calls you you have to present all over the place so you must have a mechanism of your message as a ceo in the beginning of the year and during the part of the execution part of the year in the at the year and when you do your own performance assessment must have your replicas to make sure the strategy that you formulated is communicated is understood in the right spirit and perform executed throughout the year and assessed at the end of the year this job is done by the first line managers and up and from there you have second lines and you have you know account executives or your geography leaders or your unit leaders country leaders and uh, or your general managers who actually roll back to the ceo of the organization right now the hands and the legs at the on, on the floor on the ground is done by your first line managers this is where lot of companies invest quite a big of amount of time and energy to enable these managers so that these managers are successful in running the delivery as well as people now every people manager every first line manager will have two layer responsibility the The, the business delivery that he or she assigned with for those twenty, thirty people, and the people delivery, you know, career aspirations of people, skilling, uh, uh, training and development of people so that they become future ready. So, so, so in the entire P 
people strategy, the role of manager becomes really, really critical and really become important, right? So your business goals to employee performance and the role of a manager acting as a real intermediary in between to constant feedback, to quarterly assessments, to, you know, regular hurdles, to, uh, you know, informal, formal discussions, make sure the big picture is achieved through these uh, smaller squads of 25, 30 people. Now, the role of a, a, a manager, like I said, is in two layers, right? One is the business delivery and the other is a people delivery. Within the people delivery, uh, I would distinguish, or actually I would draw this inspiration from Gary Dessler, and I'll introduce him later when I meet you face-to-face, uh, uh, -face, um, who this important author is, uh, who talks about the role of a manager, when he, when he manages people, not the delivery part, but the people part, is in two layers. One is the line manager, the other is a staff manager. A line manager is somebody who controls who dictate terms, who shows his authority to make sure everybody follows his direction. Like for example, you will say, this quarter we're going to achieve 100% customer satisfaction. This quarter we will ensure uh, we will have, you know, no uh, zero delinquencies. This quarter we will ensure there is no uh, disciplinary or any other compliance issues from customer. I think this is more authoritative, more commanding directing teams commanding teams right the other side of the people manager or a role of a people manager is trying to be a staff manager who's like a more of a coach is more of an advisor is more of a mentor right so this is where most of the leaders managers are struggling with right and at ideal we invest very significantly to make sure every manager becomes good balance combination of a line manager and a staff manager most managers do that today right uh, with all the digital world that we are living with still that element of people that element of a coach an advisor or a mentor has to really really be developed in the in the in the in the role that a people manager plays now leaders are not born they are made so when you are in the process of learning, it, it's always good to have uh, somebody to come and tell you, hey, what you've done is something wrong. You could have done something better. You could have looked at this approach to manage your people in this direction. You could have had a, a monthly one-on-one -on -one discussions with your people to understand your people better, to help your people scale up their performance or if there are will issue people you could have handled them through to performance management system in terms of people etc so, so the role of a manager when it comes to being a staff manager is going to be very very important and i'll try and give you as many examples and when we have your regular module in face to face uh, give you as many case studies or role plays to, 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 to try and understand this role of a staff manager to see how you will relate in your organization and how would how would you going forward look at this aspect of a line manager versus a staff manager right so in net hrm human resource management in the form of human capital so all of this is a human capital right is is people is knowledge is education is training skills uh, of of that particular organization so human capital is a combination of all of this and this is managed by human resource as a function and through your first line managers your account leaders general managers right up to the chairman of the organization and this is how the entire human resource in a holistic picture is looked at okay so that's the overall view that i want to begin with and um, uh, uh, so that's the overall view that I wanted all of you to uh, get, uh, you know, before we uh, actually try and understand what what does it really mean when it comes to uh, managing people or developing people strategy or, you know, uh, executing people strategy, right? So, so that's the context setting that I have and uh, I'll move on. Start pinging me if you have any questions or any clarifications you want to 
seeks little more clarity and you will be more than happy okay we will take a break around uh, 11 o'clock so i'll another half an hour and spend a some amount of time on the next slide Okay, so all the while, whatever I spoke about, the talent management, uh, which has to be a systemic approach, it can't be ad hoc or it can't be uh, suddenly thought through, right? It has to be very systematic. It has to be a uh, system driven or a process driven in the form of policies, practices, etc., etc. Okay, so the people management, like you see the slide, I hope all of you are able to see this slide. Uh, has different facets. Okay? So it has uh, your employee engagement, total compensation, employee assimilation. You know, when you say assimilation, you are new joiners coming into the system, your entire account on your onboarding process uh, and your account uh, related induction, and you absorb them into the account. Policies, what sort of uh, work-life balance that you bring in in the form of policies how do you manage your workplace discipline you know between co-workers uh, you know harassment of any nature between manager to employee or the employee to employee etc rewards and recognition what sort of rewards that we can have within the organization and how do i reward or recognize my people right and then career development right how do I help our people to grow or have careers within the organization? Most set or established organizations will have uh, a detailed, uh, what do you call, um, uh, a process or a system to, to have a career development. So this entire piece of talent management strategy has various facets. Let me try and uh, you know start with the the uh, employee assimilation as a process and from there and i'll try and go around the corner to try and cover up the rest of the pieces the employee assimilation begins with uh, you know the one step backwards is the, the entire talent acquisition piece which is a very very lengthy and cumbersome when it comes to the time taken as a process and the uh, what do you call um, um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the volumes that you hire, the quality of hires that you hire in the organization, the different channels that you that you uh, 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 you know that you bring in to hire people, um, and uh, you know the role of a hiring manager when he, he or she hires people, looking at the potential of the or future potential of the resource, uh, and what sort of technical assessments that you deploy to hire a person, etc will all be forming part of the talent acquisition. Now, it all depends on the organization strategy. This year, I've decided to be on a growth path. So I go and hire in volumes, right? Or this year I said, let me go horizontally this year. Let me ask my people to grow internally and what sort of talent out rotation or job rotations that I do within the organization. So with all of this, you, you your talent acquisition strategy uh, you would have implemented successfully and then you come into the phase of your onboarding this person and obviously your offer letters all of this will happen when you onboard a person you will make sure you would want to do a few things very uh, clear and in a very seamless manner you would want to make sure you would let the new hire know what sort of an organization you are where is it that you are gunning big to make it happen what is it that you want to do when you hire certain set of people right uh, you would you would do your initial you know uh, onboarding processes so that you reduce the learning curve from x number of days to y number of days so that people become productive in as quicker uh, part of the time than you know number of hours or number of days or number of months being taken so in the entire assimilation process, it's very important. Most leaders or managers do not understand this, that every employee assimilation program actually gives you cost benefit, time benefit, and as well as uh, ready-made resources in the quicker form of time, right? 
So you, the intent is to make ready employees to go and deliver on the floor. Right? So, and then comes to be your account related induction. You hire people, you, you assign somebody as a mentor for him or her to make sure they're quickly observing, absorbing and then reduce the learning curve and then try and understand what account am I getting into? What project am I getting into? What role am I getting into? Your your one-on-one -on -one discussion with your manager, try and understand what are my goals for the year? Uh, what I, What is it that I can expect during the part of this year, right? What sort of uh, learning uh, inputs that I can expect throughout this year? So all of this will be part of the you know, onboarding and account related information. So this is, is another important uh, uh, phase of, um, you know, your overall talent management strategy. Let me give an example of if this is not done right, what happens in the organization. I have known in a particular organization, you know, they really don't care for the employee assimilation or onboarding process. You issue an offer letter on that particular day, you have somebody sign the joining forms and you straight away put them on the job. That particular organization, quarter after quarter, year after year, maybe for the couple of one or two years, uh, went after having your early attrition, six to six, zero to three months or, uh, or zero to six months or six months to one year, their attrition ended up being more than 30%, which means if you are hiring 100 people, 30 people are leaving within the same year when they are hired for, which means all your hiring costs, your, your salary costs, your training costs, all of them is gone for a task. It, it's a waste, right? So if you don't address your employee assimilation as a management system, as a management practice in the right spirit and in the spirited efforts, it's going to be a serious uh, or a criminal waste of time and cost and effort from the organization standpoint. So today, most established organizations, most reputed organizations spend enough and more time to make sure they get the uh, right inputs, right training inputs, right organizational inputs, right account or project related inputs so they become productive in the quicker phase of time so that they become like any other regular employee to start running the show on their own, right? So most organizations are taking this as a very serious affair because if you don't, the chances that you will lose that employee within the same year of your hiring as well. So employee assimilation is, is, a, is a critical phase of uh, your talent acquisition strategy, right? So keep asking questions and repeating. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to stop at any given point in time and then we can talk about it, right? But like I said, this is going to be an overview of each of the employee or uh, people facets. We'll talk in detail in each of these facets um, in, in our eight modules that we will have, or eight classes that we will have in face to face. The other important phase of uh, people or talent management is policies, policies and procedure. I can't tell you how important they are. I can't tell you how critical they are when you manage your people. Sometimes most powerful leaders, more, most influential leaders, they think they are over and above the policy or practices. I gave you an example of this, this on, uh, you know, CEO or worldwide leader, I think Carlos is his name. Uh, he's been sacked. He's behind the bars uh, in wherever he is because he thought he's, he's, he's God's given gift to mankind, right? So, and he's minted money misusing the authority, right? So, the point that I'm trying to drive home is that as long as you work for a particular organization, whether you are a CEO of the organization, whether you are a receptionist in the organization, you, are, you and me and everybody is bound by the policies of the organization. Let me give you one more example. Somebody was fired, uh, I think as many as five or six leaders in Microsoft who are managing critical portfolios, including uh, cloud and MS Office verticals, which are highly revenue generating verticals for Microsoft. You know Microsoft uh, as an organization. They've been fired because they've harassed a female employee on the floor or when you work the board. But they've been fired. I mean, so 
So the point that I'm trying to drive home is that uh, we are all bound by certain ground rules, certain policies, and certain direction that the organization wants us to follow and believe and move forward. Okay, the policies are a pretty much or a very very integral part of talent management approach. HR as a function makes sure that across the world, across the countries, geographies, units, uh, there are consistent rules, consistent regulations, guidelines, management systems that are established, uh, keeping in mind the delivery, keeping in mind the work-life balance or well-being of an employee, and at the same time, not to lose the focus of being profitable, right? And they have to be, the more and more consistent the more and more transparent you are with your policies the better is the outcome that you get i know of an organization an indian organization who's very very skeptical of publishing their policies to the entire employee world uh, uh, employee base there are the apprehension that if i let an employee know that a policy called uh, car lease that is available to the executives and not the workmen in a manufacturing setup, people would get demotivated. So let me not publish. Let me only circulate a mail to only those executives who can benefit out of this organization. So, so, so some of these people think that people don't get to know. The point is, people are smarter than what you know any leader can think of. People get to know in any case, right? So most of the times. Uh, we try to hide things as managers, as leaders. Somebody is trying to... Okay, thank you. So most of the times what happens is that, uh, you know, certain organizations hide things. They want to be discreet with the employees. It's, it doesn't help in the long run. If you want to become bigger in size and scale as an organization, you've got to be transparent with your employees. The way you run, what sort of uh, scaling up that you want to run. So policies from that standpoint, be it uh, equal opportunities, be it equal pay to the role that you play, be it uh, no discrimination based on race, color, creed, etc. Uh, or, or trying to harass a certain set of uh, uh, harassment behaviors like you know, male and female be harassment employee to employee harassment or a manager harassing an employee or a, a particular leader trying to misuse the authority in harassing somebody uh, you know they're trying to take a grudge of a, uh, for the sake of ego management so all of these will have to be managed in the most transparent manner right most established organizations or reputed organizations have a clear laid down policy that if you do this, this is the consequences that you will get into, right? So, so, so the important phase when you manage people as future leaders or future managers is that you understand the policies or the guidelines or the rules and regulations or the ground rules, if I were to call it, use the layman language, you must know the ground where you are playing the sport. If you don't know the ground, you can't play the sport to the best of the ability possible. Imagine Sachin playing uh, his uh, 20 or 24 years of career. Unless something he understands the ground that he's playing, is it a fast pitch, is it a slow pitch, is it a flat wicket? I mean, if somebody does not understand what he or she is trying to do, the, the, the place where you are uh, playing the sport, you will never be successful. You will have spurts of excellence, but you will never be having a, such a successful or a consistent career throughout the year. So you must know your ground rules, you must know your policies if you want to be successful, uh, you know, a future leader or a, or a manager. Okay? So that's about, little bit about policy. Let me try and uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, rewards and recognition. I mean, if it was a face-to-face -face classroom session, I would want to do a bit of a group study or a group discussion around this. Normally what I do, I break up people into two parts and say, you guys talk about what do you think these rewards is all about and the rest of the group talk about what do you guys think about recognition? What does it take to recognize people or what does it take to reward our people, right? 
most of the times we think reward or recognition is as good as giving increments or promotion i'm sure some of us in the in the in the session are also of the same opinion uh, or, or a feeling right so for me in an organization either it is a promotion or an increment nothing beyond that nothing works beyond that but let me change a little bit of our perception if some of us are in that sort of a frame of mind rewards and recognition are different from promotions or increment or total compensation right so rewards and recognition what are they basically rewards and recognition is 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 an established or a institutionalized process or a system or a practice in the organization to make sure you are a performance culture driven organization how does it help what what are the some of the examples of a reward okay let me take a example of a sales organization the sales organization like any other organization will have you know your hr your marketing your finance and your uh, product team and your project management team facilities and all of those functions but unless until a sales guy who goes is expected to be in the market who is expected to go and sell that product you will not have your revenues coming in all the functions everything is well and good you establish everything is fine but unless until this sales guy runs into the market sells the product people will not have the bread and butter okay so so it's important that you differentiate the role of a sales executive versus a say for example of a facility manager i'm not saying facility manager is bad or a sales executive is a god's given gift to man all i'm saying is you must have a differentiated approach to certain roles which are which are really critical which call in for far more superior efforts than the rest of the folks in a sales organization a sales executive who takes the product and runs into the market and does the same is the most important person for the organization as in from the role that he or she plays not as a individual but the role that he or she plays right so you you normally these some of these sales organization they differentiate in terms of sales people versus non sales sellers versus non sellers if you understand that language so sellers get a separate certain for example rewards so if you do this month your 100% of targets so you get you know what do you call um, um, uh, you you know you get 120% of your bonus if i promise to say uh, 100 rupees i will pay you 120 rupees okay now as much of an importance that i am giving you as a seller i will also penalize you if you don't achieve your results if you do anything less than 80% you get zero of your incentives so so what we are actually trying to do here is i am actually motivating this resource to try and get the 100% so that organization is benefiting in terms of revenues and therefore the sales executives who is making those extra efforts you know being in the market in the cold in the rain in the hot sun to make sure sales are done he or she is differentiated with extra amount of uh, incentives so that's a crude or a simple example of a reward that you will do on a role based you can also do a reward based on team for example if there are 10 teams and each team is working on a particular product and uh, the wing leader of that all the 10 teams says if you do this year you know within 3 months if you achieve a product from scratch to delivery this is the group reward that i'm going to give you for example if you are a if you are part of a travel or a tourism kind of a segment that in the peak time between october to december if you get me a result of or a 100% of uh, sales i am going to give you a group uh, you know for and to travel for next 10 days right so it's a group reward based on you know targets or certain times individual uh, retention programs for example if you have your let me take an example of a ceo of an organization a ceo who is expected to generate ideas who is expected to be innovative who is expected to take bold decisions 
um, sometimes taking risky decisions to make sure organization is in the right direction and they are earning profits uh, uh, to the hundred percent and beyond. So he or she is expected to be a direct responsible person uh, for stake uh, shareholders as well. So, so the stakes are very high if you hire a uh, right CEO or a wrong CEO. And I'm we've known you know for more examples, including the Indian industry, where CEOs are hired and CEOs are fired. You know, classic example of a Tata's where uh, mystery has been Cyrus mystery has been hired and what you know the entire episode of what happened in the uh, Tata, right? So, 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 and another classic example of somebody given a rein in to run the CEO of of the organization uh, to to make sure the the delivery happens in the in the most uh, uh, successful uh, you know fashion right you can take an, an empty number of examples ceos who change the face of the organization ceos or a managing directors who really shape the, uh, the 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 road map for the organization so it's important that you reward and recognize such individuals who are extremely talented both in terms of strategizing things and executing things and at the same time, the same uh, time uh, sorry somebody is trying to sorry, speak. Somebody is trying to speak. Um, i have a question uh, right now i just yeah. typed the question yeah. it is like sure. all cannot sure. directly impact either the revenues or cost so how do we devise reward mechanisms based on role for uh, people like programmers etc yeah good question anu i think i wanted to cover that when it comes to total compensation but let me try and attempt your question so so the question that uh, anu is asking is how do you differentiate between um, you know uh, revenue impacting roles versus non revenue impacting roles right so it all depends on what do i as an organization define for example if there is an it industry so there is a programmer and there is a seller both roles are very very critical but there could be a third role which is intermediary between a, a product development executive to a seller in between there is a programmer and later there is an infra resource who manages the show so the differentiation that i do for a product development executive is superior in comparison to an infra uh, resource who manages the you know BAU activities to a guy who sells the product in the market because because the effort taken to build the product is far superior than running the BAU we know that for a fact and running BAU versus selling that product in the market is far more superior effort so I recognize based on effort I recognize based on um, uh, uh, the the time spent I recognize based on the skill that is needed to make it happen. So, so the significant differentiator here is the skill that I come with, is the role that I play with that skill, and is the that particular moment how critical it is, right? Most of the times, this dilemma or this discontinuity or this. Uh, uh, feeling that uh, employees will have or a, or a coffee table conversation is that why is that these people x number of people all the time get promotions and increment why is that we don't get it right so it's important questions to ask and it is the role of a manager to make sure he or she clarifies rather than joining the bandwagon and saying that yeah we are always you know shown partiality we don't get x amount of budgets than the rest of the others so it's always contextual keeping in mind the skill like i said or the, the the hotness of the skill in the market or the time and efforts taken uh, you know uh, in the markets to make it happen let me take another example in an it industry you have your uh, research or a data scientist you will have your um, uh, product executive who sells this product or you will have your project manager who's intermediary between the product to uh, the, the, the going into the uh, client and you will have a new infra guy. I'm sure you will differentiate a data scientist 
was trying to pull out the various sorts of uh, relevant information and trying to bring in a decision point to to make this particular of the 10 solutions that are available trying to suggest that this is the best solution to take this forward i'm sure he has a very very critical role to play right versus a project manager who is trying to take this solution to the product project executives who's going and sells to the market as to the differentiator it's as simple as that so net net the point is you've got to have the right skill or the hot skill for you to be differentiated with the rest of the folks you've got to have uh, the organization which feels or which recognizes this talent as a hot skill or a growth skill for me and it also has to do uh, you know uh, uh, how critical is that role right you may be a great uh, skill you may be a super duper growth skill but to that organization does it really mean at that point in time is critical is also an important question to reflect upon right so rewards and recognition comes in that differentiation comes with that flavor of uh, in in connotation towards skill and relevance to the market and uh, how good or a bad to that particular situation of scheme of things etc right and there are various forms of uh, you know uh, rewards and various forms of recognition i gave you a few examples of rewards let's take few examples of recognition as well okay uh, some examples of recognition are you know that uh, normally organizations do have your quarterly or your yearly forums where you call in people for service excellence product delivery etc individual uh, excellence awards and you know you recognize them in front of everybody you know? sometimes this recognition is also taken to the highest level possible in terms of promoting those people etc but not all the time it is connoted not all the time recognize the performance so organizations do different various other things like you do floor huddles you call the resource in front of it like you do town halls where you do recognition forum where you call up these individuals these groups these small squads these small teams to say that what is it that you do and you know this calls you to be in the hall of fame where you recognize these people display on the wall or display on the notice boards to say so and so has done an extremely good job or so and so team has done a exemplary work and etc now most of the times people or managers especially in indian context we don't really do so much of uh, recognition as much as it should be and i know a lot of uh, of some of the uh, uh, experts or some of the folks in abroad they you know they recognize every small thing that you do and, and as many small things like they thank you for every small thing that you know that you give them and both in emails or in phone calls or in a, uh, web calls or whatever they recognize they don't take anything for granted so the spirit of recognition is pretty much inherent is what i observed uh, in pockets in india also maybe but our spirit of appreciation out here in this part of the region is very very poor which is where the aspiration or the inclination towards being recognized being wanted being belonged is a serious cause of uh, concern in the organizations today is what my observation is so we'll talk a little bit more in details but please keep this in mind that rewards and recognition also do play towards your people management strategy and if you don't do them well in pockets they cause serious uh, they cause uh, or they contribute towards your attrition levels they contribute towards your low engagement or low participation of the resources etc so keep that in mind so what was the time now it's 10:50 okay so uh, do you guys want to take a break or can i carry on with career development and then we'll take a break i think we'll carry on with the career development okay so the other important phase uh, of a uh, employee life cycle where the current leaders or future leaders or management professionals aspiring to be future leaders will need to keep in mind is how do i make sure career development is 
integral part of employee life cycle and how do I give careers to people is the most important question to reflect for each manager and leader. The reason why career development is an integral part of a leader or a manager is that um, there's an article, HBR article, uh, Harvard Business Review article that I was reading, which said uh, there are two reasons why an employee exists in the organization. Reason one is career development. Reason one is, reason two is skill development. Career development as in, say, I join as a, you know, an example, if I were to iterate, I join as a level one ticket agent you know how do I become a level two agent or I joined as a project coordinator what does it take for me to become a project uh, manager I join as an HR executive or a finance executive how do I become an SME of the uh, of the function and how do I become a manager so these are serious questions serious career aspirations that every individual will have and more so these questions become imperative uh, they become uh, you know discussion points in the leadership forums when it comes to mid layered career professional somebody becomes a manager now you can't become every second year third year a senior manager and a general manager right it's, it takes longer period of time so how do i give meaningful careers in the horizontal space than a vertical space right the second aspect is the skill am i learning in my current role that i'm doing i mean imagine a resource joins in an organization and continues to do the same job for umpty number of years and uh, does not learn anything. What really happens with that resources, some of us would have experience or experiencing the current roles, roles as well, where you don't learn anything. When you don't learn anything, things become very mundane, very, uh, how would I say, monotonous, very mundane. And in that space, it really becomes uh, very frustrating to the employee and uh, frustrations build over a period of time over quarters over months or years uh, you know you slowly start withdrawing yourself now in psychology they say withdrawal is a syndrome which leads you to exit okay in in in, in corporate language that exit we call it as an attrition right so it's very important managers or future leaders we keep in mind uh, career development both in terms of meeting the aspirations of people and skill development of people both are critically important now some leaders some leaders um, yeah can i ask yeah. one more question yeah sure. yeah sure yeah sure i know the profile and aspirations of uh, some of the participants here Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. rewards and recognition is on one side, and there is also another side where people are really dissatisfied with the organization. And also, actually, I know uh, there is one Rashekar here who is not happy who left the organization, not because of the organization, but because of the manager. Mm -hmm. So, on one mm -hmm. side, it is how do you keep your employees really. Uh, uh, motivated with rewards and recognition, but there is a, another extreme side where they are not even managing uh, some of these organizations are not even managing the basic expectations of the uh, employee. So, uh, do organizations capture these basic expectations of the employee? And if somebody the employees are not really happy with the managers, the reasons. So, when do they actually capture all these things? Yeah, it's a very very pertinent and an important question and uh, you know let me try and attempt this question because it's a, it's a specific question in pockets and then to try and also answer the larger part of the problem which most managers have struggled with because they also have their own limitations as far as organization is concerned but the bottom line is i think um, Every manager who is being tagged as a first line manager who has a people manager responsibility is expected to understand that both dimensions are understood in the clear spirit. The two dimensions that I spoke about is the career aspirations of people and skill development of people. Now, most people attribute this to various excuses, if I were to call it as. For example, career, career aspiration of a of the 25 30 people that he or she is uh, uh, given with now you know this manager would say i can't promote you this year 
therefore uh, you know you got to spend some more time and as and when i get a hiring ticket i will promote you that's a simple and straight excuse some for somebody as a manager or a leader to get away with if i got to avoid that resource or if i got to uh, try and live with that particular reactive moment but if you are to really play the role of a manager if somebody is performing a role of a, say a project coordinator it really does not stop you to make sure this manager makes attempts makes networking situations makes extra efforts to make sure this person's current role becomes meaningful in the same band in the same grade in the same compensation meaning you can always give meaningful careers over a period of time by doing various things like stretch assignment or on the job shadowing with the in the newer role or trying to create x y z number of project coordinators you being the senior guy so you can always do various things uh before you actually promote that person or actually even when you promote that person now when it comes to senior roles you know i'm just specifically talking about this uh, example that i will be quoting now because of the example that you quoted for example if i were to promote somebody from x role to an sme role right some organizations have certain rules i can give an example of an organization which made as as a management practice right it said if i were to promote somebody anybody for that matter with with less experience or more experience he or she would have created number of smes or three or four ready smes before i actually promote that person why did we do that or why did that organization make that as a management system because for that organization sme is a very critical role now sometimes people have you know in in their insecure frame of mind right do not share the information are uh, they very skeptical in 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 knowledge sharing so they keep the entire knowledge or account information or a client information or the uh skill information to themselves in that context what really happens is this resource uh, and if more so you know adding fire to the fuel is the if the scale is really really hot in the market so this guy goes he goes not just with the skill he goes with the account information and all of that stuff right so it's a real clear vacuum for me to go and fill that shoes so what organizations do is that as you play the current role of an xyz role you must ensure that you would have created a replica of yourself if i were to see you there in the next level now this practice has become so very successful it became a more healthier competition more spirited competition and it actually helped us in reducing the attrition at an sme bucket sme bucket as such so i'm just trying to give one or two examples for us as future leaders or future managers uh, need to keep in mind you know every time employee who is frustrated doesn't mean that it is connoted with promotion or an increment there are pertinent other reasons areas that we don't actually cater to so most of the times we run short of ideas as managers and leaders and we try and look outside uh, or we try and give excuses to run away from the situation like the example that uh, anu quoted most of the times like ajim prems is said in your word in multiple forums right it is people who leave people and not the organization this example of raj i'm sure he is you are there in the call is you left your manager you didn't leave that organization you left the organization because of that particular man maybe because that manager has certain limitations but i am a firm believer that 90% or 95% of the times that there are alternate solutions that individuals can look up to and within the same ground rules within the same uh, you know uh, playbook that we are playing with right so i can give you couple of more examples but i think uh, i hope i kind of answered the question uh, anu yeah so i think uh, uh, i have a little bit more uh, topics to cover but i think uh, we are almost one and a half hours into the session um, so please take a break and uh, it's 11 o'clock now so we'll meet at 11:20
okay so do you need 20 minutes break or is uh, 10 minutes break is okay let me unmute you first so i think there's a lot of noise so chat is better chat is better okay so we give so we give 10 minutes break 10 minutes break yeah so it's 11 o'clock now i'll see you at 11 10 uh, back in uh, the forum okay let's see you in uh, in uh, at 11 10.
okay so okay. is everybody so, back is everybody back i see a participant see a participant So I see all uh, participants back. So we'll start uh, where we left, right? So we were talking about career development and uh, the importance of, or the, the criticality or the role that manager plays, both in terms of meeting the career aspiration in the career development, and as well as uh, skill development of the resources, both horizontally and vertically. And when it comes to skill, just to add on another uh, uh, new age uh, trends that organizations are speaking about is the uh, reskilling and upskilling, right? So please make sure that every one of you in the organizations are moving from one skill to the other or within the same skill, you're learning multiple skills, right? So multi-skilling is the new mantra for experienced resources. Uh, there is gone out those days that I'm, I am I know one skill, I am hired for that one skill and I continue to do the same skill. That's not going to uh, be the story for a longer period of time. I see Kali's message, the voice is not clear. Is it any better now? Asking you to rejoin. Uh, can you guys hear me clearly now? Okay, perfect. So I have a question from Sandeep. And uh, Sandeep's question is how to deal with people who are good at old technology and not good at new technology. I think you have the answer with you, but I'll let me try and attempt uh, this question to the best of my knowledge or to the best of my ability. So I think um, irrespective of whichever industry that you belong to, you know, be manufacturing, pharma, IT, uh, whichever industry, the most common uh, phenomena or the most common uh, talk of the discussion in various HR forums that I have been participating is that the new age trends and the new age uh, uh, skills that are really taking over the, the traditional skills uh, are going to be calling the shots. And with the advent of some of the things like, you know, we spoke at the beginning, like artificial intelligence or like robotics or the machine learning or the uh, some of these uh, new age technologies or the automation, for example, which is the most commonly utilized or the spoken or the implemented uh, uh, service plan in all, all organizations. So with all of this, if you continue to say that I am so-and-so skill, I am hired for so-and-so skill, I will live with it. Organizations will say, sorry, we are done with it because your skin, that particular old skill, uh, and I'm not telling this to Sandeep, I'm just, just sharing as a common practice, right? Uh, organization wants every employee to be part of these growth skills or the hot skills, right? So uh, you will get promotions, you will get your increments, you will get all the best of the things in that particular organization or the industry if you are learning the newer skills and newer age practices. Because with the advent of automation, for example, which is most common across all industries, is is it has automated a quite a lot of jobs. It has taken away the mundane routine tasks 
and with the technology that is being deployed um, with all of this uh, artificial intelligence etc uh, it's furthermore and more and more uh, the penetration the more and more is the gone away the traditional skills and i also gave you an example of a mainframe to cloud as an example within it industry space and with automation playing a very very significant role starting from uh, you know front office receptionist to ceo of the organization roles are taken away projects are or the teams are shrunk or you know the headcount headcount is being freed up and you know uh, the experienced resources are being replaced with the graduate hires uh, you know the traditional skills traditional skills uh, uh, people have been told to reskill or upskill to the newer skills or the growth skills or the hot skills now unless until we do that our future existence or our relevance for future is going to be a question mark it may be a good to be situation for now but i think for future we have to be somewhere becoming part of uh, these relevant skills or relevant to the that particular organization so the simple and straight answer is either you reskill or you upskill in the scheme of things otherwise we are shaped out it's it's only two ways of doing it right either you shape in with the new skills or you shape out to something else elsewhere right so 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 it's a uh, it's a it's a wake up call if some of us some of us are not aware of some of these uh, dynamics that are being played or some of these uh, uh, topics that are being discussed uh, please ensure that you are within the organization or outside the organization learning skills which are new skills which are relevant and i know for a fact i'm spending a little more time than what it is on skills is because one of the topic that i will spend uh, uh, in in our uh, modules is the topic called skills as their currency right i know when i started my careers what used to be as the currency was uh, your performance that year how did you perform in that particular role then come or the days it used to be spoken about uh, you know your bell curves which spoke about you know i need to treat x amount of amount of people in high performance y amount of people in maintain performance or satisfied performance and the rest is uh, dissatisfied performance and then move to the stage of uh, you know uh, differentiate or recognize people only with um, you know great performance or super duper performance now today most organization or most progressive organizations are talking about skill based uh, differentiation are you part of the growth skill are you part of the relevant skill or are you part of the hot skill then come and stay with me in the dining table if you're not sorry i don't have a place for you so that's the skill value framework that organizations are building in with the framework of high medium low if i am part of the growth skill i part of the high bucket if i am part of the uh, maintain skill which the skill which is relevant may be at the most for now and part of the medium group but the skill which is already redundant or the skill which is already obsolete is already declined skill so i don't invest in them seriously so this this is already coming to the industries this is already coming to the organization so skills is going to be the new currency for sure so that's confidently i can say that as far as uh, the question that sandeep uh, you asked and i'm sure uh, i kind of addressed a little bit now on the completing where we started on the career development is the the other aspect of uh, people manager or the role of leaders or future professionals management professionals or future leaders is is to also deal with marginal performance what do we mean by marginal performance people with skill or a will issue i am still as a leader willing to tolerate a resource with a good attitude but there is a problem with the skill and i'm ready to give him a mentor or a skill intervention but i am not okay with a person who has a will issue you know who thinks that i am a super duper rock star i know what my role is i know what my skill is i don't want to learn anything new 
So that's the problem that industries or leaders are facing with with certain set of employees. Now, the the flip side of the coin is managers at times are given a situation would want to avoid difficult conversations or embarrassing conversations or face with reality conversations where to call the employee and tell him or her that you know you know what your skill is no more required so so you got to scale up your performance sometimes people understand some pipe sometimes people don't understand so so it's important that um, you know we understand some of these uh, uh, marginal performers both on a skill and on a will uh, we face with it rather than try and hide behind okay kali is saying it's not clear uh, so i don't know how about others are you able to hear me clearly can you type some messages if you are able to hear me clearly guys okay okay i see few pings which are very clear so kali probably you might want to log off and log in to see if it's clear for you maybe because others are saying they are able to hear me clearly okay all right so so it's important that managers or the future leaders also deal with marginal performance or poor performance or low performance now for you to as uh, people managers as leaders is to must have a very very uh, strong and dynamic or a robust talent management programs i think anu also asked the question a little bit and i am kind of trying to address that bit of it here how do you identify talent what do you do with that identify talent and how do you take them forward when you do your performance discussions as managers leaders you must make sure you see that you know typically what you talk about nine box model where you say high potential high performance high potential low performance high potential medium performance i am okay with high potential with uh, medium performance but i am not okay with uh, low potential and medium performance because if you don't have potential if you don't have skill you can't do whatever is expected out of you so it's it's very important starting from hiring day starting from regular feedbacks regular career conversations you must invest your time and energy as manager as leader as a uh, future leader to ensure do i see the potential in the resource have i tested him in as many forms and to give that career guidance that how do i help my people future potential and how do i help my people to get future skills or relevant skills to be part of the high pot or the high potential talent population uh who constantly get uh, you know best of the things in that particular scheme of things or in, the, in those organizations the other thing that leaders could do is is to is to identify mentors and and this is where i talk about when it comes to performance management or talent management i talk about um, this my favorite statement i own my career right uh how many of the times if you really reflect for a second and see do i really own my career or or do i believe that my career is my manager's responsibility it is not my responsibility most of the times i think we live in on a on a pretext or on a or on a connotation that um, my career is in my manager's responsibility like keep here in this coffee table conversation or whenever there is an employee selection that my manager did not give me promotion or my manager is biased only to those individuals who are constantly getting promoted or or certain times i keep hearing that the manager never spoken to me he doesn't care for me etc etc i think i'll flip it a bit and say that you know gentlemen or lady have you ever thought that it is your career and you are responsible for it period reflect a moment what i'm saying it is my career and i own it the more and more you reflect you self analyze you self reflect uh and, and uh, inculcate this this thought process of it is my career and i will do whatever those 10 things it takes to make it happen to make it happen for those 20 30 years of career most of the times we come with a, with a skill and we expect that skill to run for us forever 
and therefore the challenge of uh, what the organization wants versus what do I have and, and that's where we live with this confusion and we live with the uh, the assumption that I don't get recognized in the organization I've been 10 years in the organization I just got one promotion or I did not get any promotion I saw a lot of others getting promoted right so promotions are not by vintage promotions have to be earned they have to be earned on merit they have to be earned on skills that are relevant they have to be earned on being high potential to that particular role to that particular organization so we have to be very very clear and as future leaders I want to tell you this that if you don't call a spade a spade you will try and call something else you are only frustrating the set of folks or the employees within the organization not letting the employee know that this is what my expectation out of you is rather than you know trying to sugarcoat things and then while away time and then uh, you will see a disgruntled or dissatisfied employee uh, who is all the time trying to stare at your face you never promoted me versus you know picking up a time picking up a discussion and telling them gentlemen this is not working out either you take a few months uh, you know while you do your BAU activities upskill reskill try and have mentors try and network with the industry go for an external program and try to come to the mainstream all the time you must do these discussions so it's important that career development is a career development of employees is an important phase of future leaders and future managers and some of you might be managers so so if you're not doing this please keep that as a back of your mind while we, we we iterate this message and reiterate this message to the employees that it is your career and your responsibility and it is with my career and is my responsibility period right so uh, i move on to the next topic which is the employee engagement oh sorry people management sorry so what is people management? People management, uh, you know, is an integral part of, uh, like I kept repeating multiple times, is part of the life cycle of a manager or a leader, right? So how do you build leaders within the organization? I know a lot of organizations who want to build their leadership team, starting from the boardroom team to, 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 the general managers or the entire leadership team build internally then bring them externally there could be specific uh, pertinent reasons if they want to hire from market but most of the times managers leaders are built or they are developed internally so there are a lot of programs that organizations that uh, bring in first line manager assessment uh, second line manager assessment leadership development programs etc 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 so to so make sure even if they are 60 70 percent ready the organizations are willing to take that risk of giving that opportunity as a leader as an account executive or as a project leader uh, because you know the organization you can always fall back to some of the seniors or some of the folks who already were doing those roles or identify mentors or give skill development programs and they will be most sure shots that even if there is a risk they will be able to survive through so it's important that you know uh, people management when you build leadership pipeline when you make sure your span of controls normally they say about 25 people or for a manager is the ideal situation to be in if it is more than 25 people for a first line and if it is more than 10 or 15 people for a second line uh, it's going you're not doing justice to that role right so so the span of control and uh, FLMs or first line managers assessments the leadership assessments happen rigorously and most importantly in the most transparent manner now I know a certain Indian organizations who are biased to certain individuals when I say bias the bias comes with performance now there is a difference between a potential to performance What's the difference? Potential is something that I do, I'm doing this current role, I'm capable of doing the next role as well. The performance is, I'm doing super duper performance in my current role, but I don't know whether I have the potential to play the 
same or deliver the same super duper performance in the next four. That's the difference. So it's important and most established or reputed organizations enable a lot of uh, leadership development programs or career development programs. They appoint mentors. They have dedicated, uh, you know, instructors or mentors to make sure they give career guidance to some of these leaders so that they are not derailed in the new roles or when they assume the bigger responsibilities. So imagine if somebody working out of a particular country will have to manage uh, multiple regions, multiple leaders, multiple cultures, uh, multiple sentiments, right? So, so it's, it's very critical. It's very critical that, uh, you know, uh, uh, organizations invest significant um, time, significant uh, cost, significant effort to build leadership pipeline. Unless until we do that, uh, organizations may not run longer, but live for a shorter period of time. And it has nothing to do with profits, right? So, 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 so these are the uh, intelligent arguments that HR leaders or business leaders do with the finance managers or uh, CFOs of the organizations that if I invest, this is what I'm going to get versus if I don't invest, I end up getting people from outside who doesn't, who doesn't understand the culture or the DNA of the organization and they uh, and I run the risk of either having an early attrition or I run the risk of failing miserably in the context of that particular organization, right? So I, I will have a dedicated uh, topic around uh, uh, succession planning and leadership development in my classes, but that's a large view that I want to give you. I'll move on quickly to, to the employee engagement piece, right? So how many of you know that employee engagement uh, has a direct or many a times indirect correlation with the employee retention and with the employee attrition? Most of us don't. Uh, the point that I'm trying to bring is, you know, the more and more employees are uh, iterated, employees are being uh, informed or communicated that you are, you, you are wanted in the organization, you are an important uh, person or you play an important role in, within this particular organization uh, unless until you, you as a manager or a leader bring in that sense of belongingness, you bring in that sense of um, integral part of the organization, uh, the employee does not uh, really know what you really think about his or her performance is and more the problem if there are maintained skills if there are less critical roles so I'm clearly picking up these words less critical roles versus a uh, high critical roles and more and more is, and, and, and say for example if there is a facility manager maybe a less critical role but doesn't mean that you don't need that role you still need a role right so what do you what do you really recognize such people do you really do some programs for them often than not no you don't because we think that it's a cost for them why do i need to invest on facility manager for example why do i need an uh, invest on an, any supporting functions the point is every employee needs motivation every employee needs a certain amount of pat on the back recognition all of this comes uh, engages employee and i think uh, 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 last year, when I attend, uh, when I when I was sent for a seminar in US uh, in our headquarters in Ormond in uh, New York, so one of the uh, our, you know, executive vice president uh, spoke about employee engagement and how important it is. So he spoke about a particular statement, that, and I think it is drawn from one of the HBR's journals, which said. Um, an, an engaged employee will give you, uh, they said, about 45% of performance. A dissatisfied employee will give you about 25%. So 25%, 45%. Meaningfully engaged employee will give you uh, about 85% of uh, performance of the his or her deliveries uh, or tasks assigned. But you know, an inspired employee, right? 
an inspired employee is going to give you 125% of the performance, which means if you have given a goals of say 100 of 100% of uh, uh, goals, the inspired employee is going to get you 125% of performance or delivery without even you asking for it. Now, the role of a manager, the leader, is to make sure all the time, how am I going to inspire my team members? How am I going to give uh, all that it takes to you know, make sure that they believe that whatever I do is, is, is seamless, I don't mix words, I, am, I do want the talk, and all of those things. Uh, in the context of the different phases of being a dissatisfied or an engaged or a meaningfully engaged or an inspired phase, in every phase, the role of a manager, the role of a leader is critical, right? I again fall back to what I said in my first slide, the role of a line manager and a staff manager. So, which is where I will spend some time when we have enough and more time when we meet one-on-one, -on -one, that it is, it's very critical that organizations and uh, people believe the, the, the role of this manager or a leader to engage people to make sure that we inspire people and that's where your survey results when you do pulse surveys or when you do uh, whatever gallup surveys or whatever employee pulse surveys will tell you the results are, are you do you have a team which is engaged does your team trust you does your team believe you that you give careers to them Does your team believe you that you are consistent in your message or are you partial to certain set of people and with all of this employee engagement is also to do with formal and informal uh, you know events right you know informal events like you take them out for a get together you have your potlucks etc etc just to break the ice and get the employees together to work in smaller groups and work in collaboration right more and more i i mean get rid of this concept called i and then more and more the we comes in the collaboration comes in, the cooperation comes in, the insecurities are shed away, etc. And more and more informal get-togethers help you do that, right? The formal engagement sessions are that you create forums as part of employee engagement to, to, to appreciate good work done, to help people, uh, to give a pat on the back and say that uh, this team is done uh, beyond my expectation. It, it, it does wonders from an employee morale standpoint, right? So the employee engagement, if not addressed properly, if not consistently delivered, it it actually creates a lot of damage than not done anything, right? The damage to the extent that imagine uh, under each leader, say those 25 people, you know, you don't engage your people uh, both in terms of uh, formal or informal or in terms of, uh, you know, sending that right messages all the time and consistently, uh, people get, uh, their morale get, goes down, their performance on the floor goes down. You may see that your BAU or your tick marks are done, but overall, their morale is not whatever you might be expecting in the longer term to sustain, that doesn't happen. So it's important that you keep in mind that uh, employee engagement is an integral part of uh, management professionals like you who are aspiring to be future leaders and managers. Okay. okay, so I touch upon the other phase. Um, yeah, uh, hi, uh, actually I have a quick question. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. So uh, I actually, uh, this is Raj Shekhar. I have worked with the people, uh, uh, we can't touch any manager. Mm. So, like, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, I can't touch the manager. So, how can I work with that kind of managers? And the second question is, how, how can uh, uh, we build the trust in the people which is, who is working with me? Mm. So, could you please answer to repeat these two this. questions? I hope you answer to mm. this. No, no. Raj Shekhar, you need to repeat yeah. that question yeah. again. The first question. I'm not trusting the manager, but I need to work with her not, or him. You're not trusting the manager. Yes, because uh, she, uh, she or he is not trustworthy. Okay. Okay. What is your so second question? How, how, and the second question is how we can build the trust in the people who is working with me. 
example i am a manager how can i uh, build a trust in the team okay i think uh, uh, sandeep is also asking the very similar questions sometimes there are many managers in hierarchy it will be difficult for a developer to reach out to correct manager okay so let me try and address this so these are subjective question and let me try and uh, try and be generic in answer so it may not give you the 100% of uh, exact specific solution that you are looking at like i said you know people management is all about systems and practices and how well you do these systems how well you practice these systems in the expected context is the result that you get for it's in very proportionate context that you deliver these management systems and practices uh, the the results that you will get what am i talking about you spoken about or rajesh has raised a question about being trustworthy both upwards and downwards with his manager and with the team that reports to him and similarly the question of a uh, hierarchy right so building trustworthy is all the time belonging to that particular manager how well you are transparent how good are you in being consistent with your messages i know a lot of managers and leaders who mix their words they say something to the resources they do something with the resources it's all about being consistent with your messages imagine if there is a situation in a particular year that you don't have funds for promoting people you don't have funds for uh, giving increments to people it's a very very difficult situation for a manager to run the show but i know managers who really manage the situations with being very very transparent rather than trying to hide behind and say that oh hr did not give me budget oh i only got little bit of budget and i couldn't do much about it and they set up some guidelines and i had couldn't do much about it even if the story is right that there are very limit budget or there is no budget still you got to be transparent with your uh, with your resources you got to be walking the talk with your resources than trying to be nice to certain some people trying to be biased with certain set of employees for no reason i think that's where we have a problem but if the manager has a real point of view in terms of you know i have 10 people and i only got 1 lakh of rupees and uh, if i have to give it to each individual it will be 10000 per person whereas i decided that this year i will only recognize three people out of the 10 keeping in mind the skill investment or the relevance of the skill that i have and how critical they are for me this year your message is very clear rather than saying trying to be a you know populist or a communist kind of a socialist kind of a mentality which say the simpler way to deal with this is situation is is to give 10000 to everybody so that none of them are happy and you done your job in saying that nobody should question me neither my employees nor my manager that why did you give somebody a extra somebody less the other approach is that you are differentiating performance uh within the team members and say that skill is the most priority for me and you got to be doing that right from the beginning irrespective of whether you get budget you don't get budgets right so uh, budgets is only the one aspect of people management but what's most critical is like i kept repeating is being consistent with what you say and what you talk and the example that you uh, anu quoted of rajesh leaving a particular manager is people leave people because people would have made those false promises false assumptions and over a period of time if they are not meted you are, you end up being uh, disappointed to the proportion of being to the promises being made so the consistency in message answering your questions being transparent with the teams helping people get careers the the i spoke about it in career development the two aspects of it one is the uh meeting the career aspiration of people and the skill development of people right and both of them have nothing to do with uh, by the way your uh, increment or uh, flat relation to promotion right career development can be horizontal career development if you are doing an x role why don't i give him 
enable him, make him feel important, give him, add two, three more other roles to him, let him feel important about it. If I, if he, X person is doing a skill X, let me also train him in skill Y. Let me make him relevant in multiple skills than one skill. And these are some greater value add things that a manager can do than just being uh, a silo within this closed room and you know making those false promises. I hope I'm kind of addressed in a in a larger context, but uh, specific to that individual problem. Sorry, uh, we may have to deal in an offline discussion to figure out what it is. But but what comes to me in my mind is that uh, you could do a lot of things with your resources, both in terms of skill development, career development, being very, very open in your feedback on a monthly or a quarterly basis, constant feedback. The, the, the fourth thing that you could do is uh, is to is to help the employee belong the organization by being transparent, by being uh, unbiased or by being um, uh, consistent with what you say and what you do. I think these are few things that a manager can do. Yeah. So, so, so that's uh, pretty much about the two questions that I had to share and uh, keep asking questions uh, as I move on to the the, the other topic and um, compensation. This is the most, uh, how would I say, in a leadership uh, uh, life cycle or a manager life cycle, most debated and uh, discussed topic, right? Uh, you know, I don't have funds or I have funds will be limited, etc. But let me first of all take us to the basics of what does it take to be dealing or managing with total compensation. The total compensation has few things to keep in mind. Equal pay to equal work. So there is equal opportunity for everybody to get equal pay. Differentiation should come in based on skills, based on performance and based on grades that people are or bands that people are uh, sitting in to that particular role. Right. So pay for performance based on skills, based on competencies. You know, you know competencies, right? Competencies are the, the things that are needed to form a skill, okay? So pay for performance, keeping in mind the skill and the competencies. Uh, benefits, some of the benefits that you get uh, and, and, and uh, benefits like, uh, you know, we spoke about a little bit in the rewards, right? Um, benefits like your uh, health insurance or your uh, some of those incentives right? some of those things that come in here but before that compensation by and large at our bird's eye view has two components one is direct benefit direct compensation the other is indirect compensation direct compensation will have things like your your um, base pay your um, you know, all of those uh, that you get as a fixed pay that you can call it as. The indirect compensation will have all of the things like uh, your benefits and your uh, incentives and your variable pay that organizations pay uh, year on year or time after time, right? So, and in this scheme of uh, direct and indirect compensation, uh, we start with the topics of uh, you pay for performance, you pay for skills, you pay for competencies that you and me, you and me are hired in the organization. So this also has uh, various flexible options. So based on the role, for example, a CEO or a managing director, we are given certain things like stock options, certain things like uh, uh, certain fringe benefits like a driver or a, you know some of those things. So you create options for some of those critical role holders to make sure they are their their pain points are taken care of for the kind of role that they deliver right and flexible work options like you know uh, allow me to work and some, sometimes work from home and it is okay to pay lesser salary for those i'm just giving a good example that some organizations deploy some organizations pay lesser than what market pays because because of the uh, work life balance systems that they have more work from home options so you don't have to travel every day to work etc right so and 
if you have to manage your compensation in the most consistent and a seamless manner you must have structured grades structured bands now in in hr language we call them as broad banding what is broad banding broad banding is nothing but uh, skills competencies uh, characteristics or attributes education qualification experience all of these needed to be sitting in a particular grade or a particular band and that's called broad banding i can't you know if you have a scale of 1 to 10 as bands one being the lowest and 10 being the highest if you decided your ceo has to be on band 10 because that's the top most grade that you have you got to differentiate a band 10 to a band 9 to a band 3 or a band 1 or a, a graduate higher so at every phase you got to differentiate keeping in mind skills keeping in mind the experience keeping in mind the education qualification the competencies and all of that so this which, which is why most organizations have established brands or grades within the organization now once you have established based on your business results year on year most organization do uh, industry based benchmarking service benchmarking practices example let's take an example of it industry who is an it architect for example it architect is somebody who makes the blueprints for products and services this it architect is expected to be sitting in you know on a 1 to 10 bands that we spoke about should be sitting in a band 8 for example a band 8 it architect in an indian market should be sitting in a 30 lakh salary for example and this for taking for a sake of example but this resource is sitting in say 25 lakhs of salary which is roughly around 90% of the 90 percentile of the you know uh, market right now year on year when you do benchmarking studies in a particular year in 2018 i say it architect should be in band 8 it architect architect should be earning a salary of 30 lakhs it architect should be given esops it architect should be given x y z versus this organization which is allowing him to sit in band 8 which is fair enough we are as per industry standards it architect should have been paid 30 lakhs whereas i am paying 25 lakhs so i should do something as part of the salary correction it architect should have been given esops but i am not giving but let me see if i can give something else in, in instead of esops like a cash retention or a retention bonus or something and that is how i kind of uh, tie in with where the market is and where am i standing today so that's how industry benchmark practices or surveys or studies will help you uh, align with the bands that you have to the skills and the relevance that you and me will bring in so here i kind of uh, pause and kind of recapitulate whatever we said so far right so i see somebody pinging me okay i have a ping which says what if you, if everybody is overpaid so if i understand this question right so 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 sandeep's question is if everybody is overpaid for example if band 8 is to be paid at 30 lakhs and you are paid 35 lakhs you are overpaid today organizations are doing couple of things to address that particular situation um i know a few organizations which bring in a concept called market percentile market percentile in ex organization can be seen as the percentage of salary that you should be in versus where you are either you could be more or you could be less in cases of less you know we just discussed in the example in cases of more what is it that we can do either you help the person to move up the road or you stop giving him hikes or you stop recognizing that employee if the guy is super duper critical for you very very hot skill working on a extremely critical project try and recognize him in various other forms like i said rewarding or recognizing doesn't have to be all the time in promoting or increasing salaries it could be through retention programs cash retention programs uh you know vouchers or it could be 
uh, ESOPs, it could be you can do a whole lot of bunch of things that you can work with your HR partners and business leaders to make it happen. But if there is the, the problem is these are all good things to be looked at and you know music to the ears to hear, right? If I am overpaid and my skill is redundant or maintain skill or I am not a growth skill or I am a declining skill in the market. You know, each of us will know if you do a self-analysis of your role. Then the problem starts. There, if the skill is not relevant, and I'm an experienced resources uh, sitting at a 35 lakh salary versus I'm supposed to be paid a 30 lakh salary. And I don't get increments year after year. And I, my experience goes up. I continue to deliver. As an employee, I think I'm a rock star. But organizations think you're good for nothing. Or... You're only good for BAU. You don't. I don't need you for the kind of salary that I'm paying. So, 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 so the value-based uh, resource management needs to come in place. What sort of a value that I'm hiring or having the resource versus the delivery that I'm having? So those are the set of folks will be dealt in the form of no increments, in the form of uh, reskilling or upskilling or in the form of moving them to bench to pick up opportunities where there are bigger roles or where there are roles that fit into the kind of salary that he or she should do, then the clear message that I got to scale up. Which is why I said constantly, sooner or later, you know, if you are part of growth skill for now, good situation to be in, but not to be smiling all over, but make sure you're all the time having multi-skilled resource than a single skilled resource. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. You have to be multi-skilled resource than a single skilled resource. Even if you're being a part of hot skill today, that hot skill may become relevant in the next few years. And uh, I read in some survey and one of the discussions also, I got iterated this message. A skill which was relevant 10, 15 years back was, was to be relevant, say, uh, on an average 10 to 15 years. But today, the relevance of skill is not more than two to three years. If I know a skill today, it may not be relevant. Or if I'm a growth skill today, it may not be relevant after three years from now. What will you do for a 30 years career if that is a situation we have to be living in with? So therefore, it's important that people with higher salaries than what it is expected, you have to be all the more be alarmed, be told. Again, the role of a manager, I go back to that context, my favorite topic. The role of a manager to manage high skilled, high salaried people is to make sure multitask or sorry, more than multitask, uh, multi skilled resources, right? So, so, so on the, on the, I hope Sandeep, I've answered your question, uh, a very high level view answer, but we can talk when we meet one on one uh or in in the classroom in, in in various forms to figure out how do we deal with such situations but just to bring back into context that human resources is all about systems management systems and practices for a consistent seamless transparent uh, people delivery people execution people strategy and execution of that strategy year on year quarter on quarter and yet try to be very cost efficient because people are the people fixed cost is roughly around 60% of the overall cost of the organization, which is a very, very big element in any organization. So 60% of your overall cost is, is on people. So it's important that we all understand this people aspect of, uh, of an organization is, is, is understood in the right frame of mind. And all of these topics that you are seeing here, um, you know, are, uh, are are important and we understand them in 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 a decent uh, frame of mind you know and we'll talk about each of them uh, in the rest of the classes uh when we meet uh, in classroom sessions uh let me move on to the next uh, slide we have another 30 minutes but let me try and cover as much as possible so talent management is a systemic approach. We spoke about it. It can't be reactive. It can't be spur of the moment, but it has to be a systematic, planned, and executed. If it can't be planned, it can never be systematic. And this applies to both our individual careers and 
for organizations to be successful as well. So talent management is no strange to this, have to be a systematic in approach. Now, if you have to be systematic in your approach, you got to understand two things very clearly as future uh, HR leaders or future management professionals, future leaders, managers, etc. The two things that we spoke about it, the role and the delivery model and the responsibilities that you bring in with. Okay, I don't want to read all of them, but first of all, if you are a leader, future leader, do you understand your role? And that question I think uh, Rajesh, you asked, what if, if my manager is tra not transparent or biased? So the question goes back to, do you understand your role very clearly? If you are a management professional who manages people, do you understand the role of a, being a coach, being a mentor, being a leader who gives meaningful career, career aspirations to people, meaningful skill development to people? A big question mark today, but I think it's a debatable topic. Secondly, a manager or a leader will have to play a role of delivery as well. So in the delivery operations, how do you look at your delivery? As soon as you are dissatisfied customer, do you jump onto your teams and you know blast them left, right, center? Or do you absorb the pressure and soak in that pressure and give them in the spirit that it is needed versus you know, jump on in everybody and fire a few set of people and then take all of those nasty decisions in managing your people, right? Um, how uh, strategic, how um, uh, holistic picture that you bring in as a leader, as a manager, when you manage your people, when you manage your delivery, right? Because not all customers are going to be nice and uh, straight with you. They've got to be they're going to be customers or clients who are going to be very nasty, very demanding, very um, uh, discouraging, but still you got to hold the port very tight and strong. So how do you how do you live up to those expectations from a delivery standpoint? And what does it take from a, your accountability, your responsibility standpoint? I spoke about it in as many times that multidisciplinary, you got to be multi-skilled, multidisciplinary guardian of talent you know you have to make sure by playing the role of all those aspects that i spoke about employee engagement uh, total compensation rewards and recognition so you have to be a serious custodian of uh, the, the top talent or the skills which are relevant manager of free agents right you have to be a messenger you have to be flowing messenger of both top down and bottom up most of the times we are top down it's, it's a known thing right uh, our leaders tell us what we want we go and tell our teams what we want but you have also have to be bottom up what is it that people are dissatisfied with can you give that feedback upward and be a be a uh, messenger for them can your teams can your 20 30 people within the team look up to you as a leader who can voice out their concerns Question, question to all of us for us to reply. Uh, own business responsibilities. In the example of uh, client is bombarding and blasting everybody, and in those situations, can you be the front runner and say you take the onus on the failure that has happened, and you give the credit to people whenever good work is done. So can you be that manager of substance and character? Reflect for us to reflect. So that's going to be the future for us. And the three potential future readiness blind spots. Not sure if you are uh, heard about uh, anything called blind spots. Uh, if you've heard about this gentleman called, make a note of this gentleman called Johari. Okay, J O H I R I. Johari is a psychologist uh, of with eminence, and uh, he has a model called uh, blind spots. So he says uh, he's got four boxes. He says. A space of life which only I as an individual will know. My parents does not know, my teachers don't know, my leaders don't know, anybody, nobody knows. And there is another bucket which says, I know some bit of it, my external world also world knows some bit of it. The third bucket that he speaks about it, I don't know of it, but my future world knows of it. The fourth bucket that he speaks about it, 
there is absolute consistency with what they know and what I know. So in every bucket or in, in every quadrant, there are things that I know or things that I don't know. So these are called blind spots. Now, how is it relevant for us to discuss here? The blind spots, unless until you're being told, which is why I kept on talking about the role of a manager and leader is not just to run the delivery, but to make sure that you give feedback, you coach people, you mentor people to, to tell them what are those blind spots for them. Today, managers are shying away. Leaders are shying away in telling those what those blind spots are. There's a way of, way of packaging it, messaging it. But most often than not, you're not doing that. So we must ensure, first of all, you pay an enemy to correct you. That's what their enemy saying says, 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 right? So the blind spots have to be all the time to be sought after. You should ask your, you know, your mentors, your peer group, your managers, your networking community to let you know what are those blind spots. For example, if I'm a, if I'm a uh, product developer or a, what do you call, programmer, okay? If I'm a programmer of a Linux, for example, just taking an example, right? I only know only some bit of it, but can we also know a Linux can get into cloud space, it can get into artificial intelligence, it can get into X, Y, Z, and all of it. Do I know them? Probably not. So those blind spots from a skills perspective needs to be sought out. Secondly, I'm a programmer with a very, very poor communication skills. But I think it is, it is okay to have a technical skill. It is okay not to have any other skills. It's a blind spot. It's a serious blind spot if you have to build your career beyond a programmer level. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. You can't be lifelong uh, for 40 years of a career, be a programmer, right? You have to grow. You have to uh, make careers out of it. If you have to do that, then what would you do? You have to work on your blind spot of communication, a blind spot of articulation of thought, a blind spot of can you make real good paragraphs of leadership messaging? I doubt most of our functional experts really disasters at communication and uh, packaging the communication in the way it has to be. So look at those blind spots. Now, some of the clear blind spots for the managers and leaders in the professional world, in the corporate world, in the market world are uh, lack of awareness for newer organization structures. They are getting flatter, they are getting linear, how are you able to see through this disruptive world? It's a very, very disruptive world, friends, irrespective of which industry you come from. I spoke up, to, so spoke to you enough and more times about the things that are coming our way, like automation, and all of those tools, techniques, uh, which are making us structures or organization structures very leaner and flatter. The role of you as leader, as manager, and CEOs of the organization to see through these structures in making roles relevant to people. That's a very serious uh, topic that I'm talking here. Secondly, increasing fluid talent. Talent which is very, very fluid. Let me give an example, and I, I think I spoke to you this particular topic to the second batch that I am dealing with. Fluid talent. Fluid talent is, for example, an organization which, which has a 10,000 employee base. 10,000 employee base, say five years back, is 90% managed by experienced professional with more than five years, six years of experience and up the ladder that way. Come five years now in 2018, 19, you know what most organizations are talking about? They are saying, I want 60%, 60 to 70%, my workforce, my, my 10,000 people have to be millennials or graduate hires. Look at the paradigm shift that is happening. So this talent is skill ready. This talent is interdisciplinary ready. This talent is ready to take risks. This talent is willing to move locations. You know, how, how many times did we hear that example that, oh, I am from Hyderabad and I want to be placed in Hyderabad as a location. 
but this increasingly fluid talent is is up and running to take up the gauntlet and run forward so it's a question to all of us as future leaders to consider this blind spot that how how much of this fluid talent are we welcoming and if you don't welcome you will be part of the redundant uh, or absolute uh, workforce which is which is no more relevant so the fluid talent uh, or, or the acceptance of this fluid talent is going to be the way forward and more the reason because this millennial generation has better economical exposure better education exposure better education institutions that they come from including the iits the nits or top 10 colleges of the cities so they have the better qualification better education better communication so so are we blind to some of these new age workforce that are coming our way please reflect the third thing that i uh, that is a blind spot in the organizations in the corporate world is the talent diversity how many of us are how many managers are averse to hiring female workforce with the reasons that oh if i hire a female resource she will get married and go and take a sabbatical oh if i hire a female resource she will go on a maternity leave oh if i hire a female resource she will uh, pick up a job where her husband is working oh if i hire a female resource you know she will have to take care of or aging parents or in laws etc so that's a serious uh, blind spot today most organizations are taking concrete and uh, cognizable uh, talent decisions to increase the diversity of workforce more and more you bring in diversity both not just as a, a female that's just one example bring in people from different regions different cultures different uh, mindsets better is the innovation better is the skill mix up better is the uh, what do you call the results on multi skilling that will come your way and better is the biases that will get killed you know how many times we heard uh, i mean uh, there is no biases around this but just that there used to be a talk few years back that if you are wanting to work in chennai you have to know the tamil as a language because in board rooms tamil as a language is being spoken about right even today in one of some of one of the indian mnc organization there is a you know rumor that in the board rooms tamil as a regional language is being spoken and i am not sure if this happens in gujarat or the world etc etc but just to take few examples with due respect to them that unless until you encourage diversity unless until you encourage different mindsets different cultures different uh, breeds of talent between millennial to experienced to male female ratio to uh, all of this combination you will never foster innovation you will never foster skills that are needed for future so be cognizant of these blind spots for future uh i move on to the next uh, topic um, which is uh, which is where i will end uh, the session for today is the um the now and the future the bucket that you see on your left hand side is the current situation in hr when you say hr people right so i could have changed the word to people but just to save some space on the on the slide i use the word called hr but otherwise when i say hr it is about people right and you are people manager you are the delivery managers who manage people the current situation of people today how many of us other than the millennials are adapting the new age technology so we have the study proves that we are slow technology adoption folks we are behind the technology curve right today people are talking about watson taking decision for cancer patients we heard about it right so we heard uh, artificial intelligence take giving uh, suggestions to nephrologists and oncologists to to see the trends and the patterns to determine the stage of the patient and what sort of accurate medicine that you could diagnose for to get the kind of a technology that's evolving versus a doctor who used to decide the or who used to call the shots I'm just giving an example of a technology with a high skilled uh, labor called a doctor in a 
a pharma or a medical space. Inability to create a business case for technology investments. You know, can you, as a manager or as a leader, make up a statement that if you do this, this is what your profit and loss is going to look like, versus we are more of a, I am being told to address these five delivery things and manage these 25 people. That's about it. My year is gone. Versus, can you really, do you really need 30 people to manage these three, four things? I can run the show with 10 people. How many times did you make that business case? Question to reflect and uh, pause to ponder, right? User adoption often in an afterthought. Oh, I should have done this. Yeah, this, you know, what's just 25 people to 10 people? It came to my mind, but you know what? I just really did not give a serious thought. You know, this afterthought syndrome has to be checked immediately, right? Uh, you know, our our ability to intake the technology space and the trends that are happening in the market has to be on path, if not faster than what market thinks, right? So there's no point in brooding over or saying, oh, I should have done this. Nobody's going to give you brownies or goodie points for that, for the afterthought. So you have to be up on, on, uh, up or on, or otherwise don't really be sorry about what you could have done despite knowing, right? Versus the current situation, what is it that you can imagine for future, right? As a tech savvy and the technology is more call and the shots in respect to the industries, right? So the few things that you will keep in mind is you are market aware, you are a smooth collaborator, which means collaboration is not an easy skill to adopt. Let me tell you this, guys, because you are expected to work in smaller groups, you are expected to work with multiple stakeholders and yet get the desired results. So which means you have to be serious influencer. You have to be able to negotiate the desired outcomes that you want to give careers to people, to, to your people, to give skill development to your people, to give promotions to your people, to give increments to people and yet be a collaborator. It's a great skills and sought after skills in the organizations today. Commercially astute. So when you say commercially astute, and I think uh, I, I I heard one of my HR leaders uh, who's, who's made this statement, uh, which is very, very uh, firmly registered in my mind, is the, when you have to work with business leaders, when you have to work with CFOs or financial people or financial analysts, if you are representing HR, you must be, is, is, is quote unquote, he says, um, uh, intellectually uh, fact-based arguments have to be made. Intellectual fact-based argument. So you're intelligent in terms of what's, what's happening in the market. You are data-driven. You don't speak English for the sake of it. And you make an argument out of it. You don't say yes to whatever is being told to you. You have to put your foot down and say that uh, this is what you know, my data says I have a regular 30% attrition versus a industry average of 15%. I have my skills into uh, uh, automation, into Citrix, into XYZ skills. I lose consistently versus the cost of hiring these high skilled labor is, is phenomenal. So you're making an intelligent fact-based argument you don't succumb to just because it is told because it came from a senior leader right so you have to be commercially astute in making intellectual fact-based arguments there's no point in making arguments but you have to be business results driven solution oriented nobody is going to give you credit if you don't get results at the end of the day right so tech champion you are easily adaptable to technology changes versus being abrasive or being trying to stop those um, you know technology disruptions that are happening and an agile learner all right growing one skill versus having multiple skills trying to learn multiple skills trying to stay relevant are the these are the few things that are needed for the future right i take a pause here before i take a pause i kind of recapitulate uh, whatever we discussed so far. So I tried to give an overview of what HR 
as a function is all about into it, it cuts across different facets of people then we spoke about uh, different things needed to stay relevant then different blind spots that you, you and me as future leaders current managers future leaders will have as blind spots be aware of them what is it that you are in you and me are in current situation today what are those few things that are needed uh, to be you know having those skills those traits as reimagining for future right so i take a pause here before i give you a 10 minutes time for you to interact with me so i can you know open the chat i'm aware i'm on the chat ask me questions and i will open it up otherwise if i unmute you all then i think uh, there's a lot of uh, disturbance we try and unmute for a second and see if it is better bad it's really bad so let me you know see you here uh, in the chat please ask question i saw a few of you asking questions like sandeep rajesh and uh, i want uh, the rest of the folks also ask me questions do you think you get a sense of what we spoke about all this while about people hr skills etc or you could have done better or you know i am open for feedback as well so what are your responses i'm curious to know um, i want to ask one question right uh, yes I'm so right. most of the questions i see from rashikar or sandeep uh, or others okay they are uh, you know we are still thinking from the point of view of an employee but um, once we get into this course and we try to become leaders and uh, managers mm. we have to think from the organization benefit organization from the mind of the organization instead of uh, from the mind of an employee so okay. how do we shift our tables from thinking as an employee to thinking from the organization perspective okay so it's a good question so so my first assumption uh, is the moment we are part of this management program i assume that we all aspire to be future leaders and managers if you don't have that mindset then i think we are sitting in a wrong forum and then we are doing the wrong discussion here okay so the first and foremost be a firm believer that you aspire to make your career big in the corporate world you aspire to be both um a functional expert of what you do in the current role and what you want to do in the current role as a functional expert besides the uh, uh you know people management delivery right both have two significant skills and traits that are needed so delivery versus people or delivery and people it's not versus it's and people right so the more and more you you want to become you have this uh, desire to become management professional you want to become a leader you want to become a future ceo why not so if that is the intent then i think um, we need to understand some of these uh, uh, management processes management strategies in detail and with insights now leadership is all about bringing in your ideas your insights your ways of doing things right it can't be you know run your tasks that are given as day to day delivery that anybody can do that a you know regular band one or a band two guy also can do why do we have so many systems and so many layers within the system uh, including up to ceo level to make some of these things happen in a very very fast paced manner and yet be cost efficient so so first and foremost uh, to the question that anu is trying to help all of us to understand is that be a firm believer that you want to become a future leader with the best management capability secondly you want to be up and on culture behaved guys rather than just being a delivery managers if ever you given that opportunity third is you need to know what are the things that it takes to become a real successful leader it is not good enough to be tagged as manager be tagged as leader but how effective are you in that leadership role how effective are you in that managerial role right 
it's not a tick mark for you to sign off leaves and then you know give one yearly increment it's important that how are you giving meaningful careers to people meaningful skill development to people meaningful opportunities for you to create for them and make sure uh, uh, you know your, your, your people are successful for you right so i hope you understand this clear difference between being a just a functional expert versus being a future leader you know if some of you are current managers how are you going to be relevant for future uh, you know management roles that are coming your way anu i hope uh, i kind of addressed or let me know if i have missed the question as such hello anu are you there okay guys any questions any more uh, uh, responses reactions to me i'm curious to know your responses i i i, I saw one or two uh, responses i saw some of you asking questions some of you are very very silent so the silence is very dangerous i'm really scared of the silence so it could be either you understood everything in just 2 3 hours with such a big topic or you are ignorant of what you are talking about what i am talking about or in, you are indifferent to what i am talking about right <laughs> which i i hope it is not the case so just let me know whether it is useful you know whether you are able to get the content you are able to make some relevance of what i am talking about then i think uh, we spend a good two two and a half to three hours yeah anybody wants to comment nobody wants to come in okay okay oh there is there's one sandeep says there is uh, there are ai is coming in future a lot of people see the management roles are getting reduced it it's actually not it is the other way around on one way we are thinking new age skills are going to take away jobs the actual leaders actual business leaders you know what is their biggest challenge today is not finding opportunities but having lack of skills people don't have the new age skills that are available in the market you know that so why don't you grab those opportunities all of us why don't we grab why don't we become part of those new age skills right be it ai you know digital security specialist data scientist uh whatever cloud platform specialist your robotics and so many new age technologies that are coming our way and and it's just a mindset guys let me tell you in answering back to what sandeep is asked uh, it just um uh, our notion or actually our assumption that it is going to take away our jobs uh that do we have careers for future the answer is it's actually a bigger problem for leaders that they don't have skills to deploy these new age skills versus Uh, jobs are being taken away right so the more and more you and me are skill relevant are learning are being multi skilled then it will help the managers and leaders to try and deploy as quickly as possible even if the markets are changing even if the industries are changing even if the cutting edge technologies are coming the more and more multi skilled you are you are deployed in one skill or the other uh, and that's how you will see your way forward but do not be under the assumption or under the pretext that i know one skill and let it be there forever and that's about it i don't think that will be the way forward right so and that's how it will help the management in future sorry raiko actually uh, i was talking but i was listening and talking but you see to be you know, it was cut Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I got the answer. I got the answer. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. No problem. Uh, another so, question. Was, yeah. Uh, we have of one small question before we leave. Sure. Uh, so there are some members in this group. Uh, not all in this chat now, but many of them want to make lateral shifts. Okay. So, uh, 
I know Swati here on this list. She wants to move into uh, HR. She wants to become an HR going forward. Oh, and okay. uh, I know Kali. Kali is from oil and gas, and he wants to move into uh, uh, into IT sector as a functional expert in oil and gas. Okay. So there are people in this group who want to move, uh, make lateral entries, shift their careers. So. Uh, how do they prepare for such shift in a generic way, not just okay. for uh, yeah. Sure. How do they shift? Sure, sure, Anu. Uh, so that's the one common question that's coming across all batches is that, uh, you know, if I, even if I have chosen to pick up a particular role at the beginning of my career, now I want to make a shift to an X function or a Y function. I think my response, I can't give a solution. But my response to that question will be, uh, that uh, query will be, is that first of all, understand where you want to get into, right? Be it HR, be it uh, technology change, be it skill change, be it industry change. Be very, very clear, ask as many people, network with as many people, have your mentors. And that's one question that I keep asking for everybody. You should have every professional should have a minimum of 10 mentors guiding you uh, helping you cruise through your career if you don't have you already missed the bus all these years please make sure you have enough and more mentors to tell you you know whether you're taking the right decision or a wrong decision have enough and more iterations from your peer community here from your mentors and from your own self assessments like i said intellectual fact-based argument uh, that what does your intelligence tell you that if you've done so much as production so far you want to get into it now it is very very generic statement that's a that that's a twenty-five thousand feet above answer now break it down where exactly in it you want to get into what time frame will it take um, what does it take to what sort of investments that are needed and by the time you learn Maybe by the time you learn those two, three years, do you think this skill is going to be still relevant? No, you must do that level of a deep dive uh, and make a plan, clear plan, to be honest, uh, before you actually make those career shifts. Because it has a lot of risks, by the way, you must have realized by now. So uh, evaluate those risks, both in terms of pros and cons, what sort of an appetite that you can uh, take it if you have to mo make those career shifts because every career shift that you do, that means you will have to start all over again from ground zero. I'm not trying to discourage. It's a good question to ask. So if I am going to have spent five years in my current role, I, move to, I make a career shift to say from HR to IT, which means first five years are gone. And I'm back on ground zero. It it, it, it it has to take, you know, from ground zero to make it happen from there step by step. So does it really make sense is a good question to ask. The third thing that I wanted to talk all of us, what skills are needed to be there, right? Do not go with a mindset or with a thinking that HR is all about uh, you know, I, I keep hearing this commonly about my own profession, right? That it is all talking to people, so it's, it's easy to deal with, right? So do not go with such um, uh, comments or such uh, say, statements being made. Try and understand from the experts of that particular function to give you the real advice. If you really ask me, somebody wants to move from X function to HR function, as a HR professional for the last 18 years, I can say that life is not easy because HR function has also gone through significant transformation. Be it HR partners, be it compensation professionals, be it talent professionals, be it learning and development professionals. What used to be 10 is, to, I mean, 100 is to one HR executive has become 1000 is to one HR executive. So ask right people the right questions is what my third advice would be. Last but not the least, uh, uh, Please ask this question time and again. Do you really need this change at this point in time? Are you making this change? It's more of a self-analysis or a self-reflection, I would say. 
is the question that am I wanting to make this change because my manager is not taking care of me or because this organization where I am working is not giving me enough growth that I wanted because I spent five years or seven years I'm still earning uh, whatever 50% uh, less than what my uh, college mate would have earned 50% more than me so is this comparison in the social group that is causing you to make this decision or be in the same function try and pick up the new age skills of that particular function uh, I mean, it takes a lot of effort to do that I'm not saying it is easy right would that help so do not get emotional when you are making the career decision is what my fourth submission will be so there is no reason there is no point in making emotional decisions if you have to uh, you know plan your career and, and and I will close with this statement that careers are built they are not made they are built step by step year on year year after year uh, with a lot of uh, 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 cautious uh, effort they are, they are made with thought of uh, uh, skill development. They are made with a lot of effort, a lot of hard work. Every day, 10 to 12 years of effort, uh, lots of effort is being put into and you make year after year progress. Yeah. So, so which means you have to be equally paying attention to skills, competencies, etc. than getting emotional. You can get emotional with your family members and with your friends. But never in the workplace you should get emotional. I think those are my responses. Yeah, thank you so much, Raju. Sure. We really do every as every time again. It's a wonderful session. <laughs> thank uh, you. Every time I attend the session again, I learn a lot of new things. Um, sure. Just a request, Raju, because you will be uh, the future HR professor for this batch too. Uh, we have formed the WhatsApp group for the new batch for the 2019. Okay. okay. Um, do you mind me adding you to this group so that if people have questions, they will ask you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Not an issue. Definitely. I'm, I'm all uh, open to kind of addressing uh, any piece and of advice. Kind of, yeah, this batch is still uh, kind of trying to get uh, to understand what they will get out of and how it will help them. How to make a career out of this so they might be having a number of questions yeah and, and so adding you to the group please uh, help us uh, stabilizing on this ground yeah sure 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 but it will be the only ground rules that whatever questions queries that you may have i can give you based on my practical experience and what i see in the industry and uh, what i have a little bit of uh, global exposure that I get and the, the some of the industry experts that I interact with it will be based on that uh, I may not be able to give individual specific solutions I can comment I can mentor I can coach in pockets but solutions is something individuals will have to really put those efforts to make it happen Sure, I understand that. Uh, thank you so much, Raipu. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Sure. Um, you can be active, ask Raipu questions on the uh, group. Uh, this is, as you all know, uh, nobody will judge you, and it's a no impact. It's, even in your office, WhatsApp, or anywhere, there will be some judgment related to all your questions, but this is a ground where you have to learn. So just be free enough to ask questions, contribute. There is very little contribution from this match. So please try to put more questions, take more answers from others, take others' perspectives, etc. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much, everyone. Uh, yeah. I'll, uh, yeah, yeah. So Last but not the least, uh, have a happy Sankranti holiday, guys, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Rakesh. Bye. All the best, guys. Have a nice weekend. Bye.